Oi, Leif. What? I have been thinking. You say that you're Dungeons and Dragons crafter, yeah? Well, yes, that is right. Why do you ask? You have made all these nice trees, hills, scattered terrain, and even bloody rivers, yeah? Yes, and people seem to really like. Oi! Don't interrupt me, mate. See, that sort of terrain is a dog's bollocks, yeah? But isn't the game called? Cool? Dungeons and Dragons, not Forests and Dragons, eh? Now, I am simply stating that you might actually need to start building terrain for an actual dungeon. You know what I mean? Well, what should I do then? I know. What if I make some wonderful stone pillars? <laughs> oh, what, mate? Hey folks, my name is Leif, and I want to welcome you to my YouTube channel called Devs and Dice, where I paint miniatures and craft terrain for the tabletop. Today I'm going to show you how I made these nice looking stone pillars. Now before we get into the crafting, I see that only a small portion of my viewers are subscribed to my channel. If you like what I do, then please do me the favor and subscribe to the channel, especially today because it happens to be my birthday today. With that, let's get started. All right, so for this, I'm going to use my Proxon Hotwire Foam Cutter. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut some square staves that are one inch in uh, diameter. Now, the reason why I went with this was really just because it's a standard measurement in the most 28 millimeter games. So once I had a couple of staves, I essentially cutting them into cubes. Now, I wasn't 100% certain exactly how, you know, I would build these things, but I essentially cut a bunch of cubes. Now here for the bottom, I think I'm going in with 1.5 uh, inches, so one and a half inches, and I'm essentially doing the same thing, cutting it into a stave. That being said, here I'm actually uh, cutting them down to half an inch pieces, and these are going to be the tops and the bottoms. Now I wanted to, you know, make a sort of bevel, and I knew that my uh, guide and my hot wire foam cutter can be adjusted to have about 45 degree bevel. So I cut this for the top and the bottom pieces. And as you can see, the Proxon hot wire foam cutter makes an easy job out of these bottom and top pieces. Somebody said, uh, looking at this, that it looks like cookies, and yeah, I guess so. Here I'm coming in to about three quarters of an inch and these pieces are going to function as sort of um, in between pieces for uh, the top and the bottom. I've looked at certain, you know, reference shots for different pillars and this was my take on it. So essentially here I am I'm slicing them in half and I don't know the exact measurement, but it was sort of eyeballing it. And here I'm just sort of cutting a bunch of these and I will need two for each pillar. And I don't know if uh, <laughs> you know me or if this is your first video, but I, when I do something like pillars, I generally do enough so that I will not have to do them again, uh, essentially. Here I'm cutting a thinner piece and this is also three quarters of an inch, I want to say. And this one, though, I am cutting three quarters of an inch wide and long, but sort of the height is one inch tall. And I'm going to need one for each pillar. I usually say that it's a good thing to dry fit as often as you can. And here is my dry fitted version of it. And I think it has a certain style and promise that I, I liked. So, on to beveling these blocks of XPS foam, or stone. Now, I could have beveled these using the uh, hot wire foam cutter from Proxum, but I actually went with a handheld one just to get that sort of cut out stone look a little bit more. Plus, it allowed me to put in some additional details, as you can see. 
And I did this on all of the pieces. And in the back there, you can actually see some test pieces that I did also. And yeah, your uh, hobby table will be quite full with different uh, types of weirdly shaped XPS foam. But this was all of the pieces done. Now, in order to get that nice stone texture, you can see I even have some old bricks in this one. I'm using the old coffee can and a bunch of rocks. Now, I don't go overboard with this, but I, you know, I give them a few good, you know, shakes. Now, I think this also depends on the nature of your specific XPS foam. Mine is quite fragile, I would say, and a little bit more airy, not as dense as some other I've seen out there. But once I textured all of the pieces, then it was basically all about assembling. Now assembling the pieces, I just plucked out the number of uh, you know pieces I needed, and then I started with the easiest ones uh, to glue them together. And for this, I'm using hot glue because I wanted to expedite the process as fast as possible. Here you can see I start with the bottom and then I glue that small in-between piece and on that uh, one inch cube and on that one inch cube another one inch cube and then we have that three quarters I think it was of, a, of an inch cube that goes in the middle and this is also good you have some working time when it comes to the hot glue so make sure that you your alignment is true so to speak and this I simply do by just eyeballing it and then you know feeling with the fingers like does the distance feel approximately the same and if there's some small you know minor errors that's okay that just sort of gives to the feel you'll see in the end that none of these are, I would say, 100% uh, you know, straight, but I think that just adds character. So that's how I glued one, and now, once I had one down, basically it was just to, you know, sit and listen to a, you know, a podcast or something. My particular poison is, I think I'm now um, on the third book with Gotrek and Felix. I think it's called Troll Slayer, and just finished that one. Nice time, actually. So this is what it looks like, and I got all together, let's see here so I remember, I think it's 16 pillars, but I'm going to do something a little bit different with four of them. But first, before I do that, I wanted to texture these so they look, you know, cracked and whatnot. And my preferred method, and again, your mileage may vary, but I like to use a Sharpie because the alcohol actually melts the phone ever so slightly. And you remember me mentioning that I was going to do something special with four of them? Well, here it is. Four of them I broke in half, essentially. And I went with the thinnest part, the three quarters of, a, of an inch part for all of them. So that meant that I had some longer pieces and some shorter pieces. And here you can see I just textured it with uh, a stone that I have. And for all of these pieces, if the good thing is the measurements really lend themselves quite well for 28 millimeter scale. So you can use them for cover, uh, you know, characters can stand on these, all of those lovely things. All in all, I had, uh, what is it now, uh, 20 pieces. Now, as it, <laughs> as it uh, happens to be, I had exactly 12 washers of the correct size. So that made me super happy. And this was not planned. That was just pure dumb luck. Now, the reason why I'm putting the washers on to the bottom is, of course, for stability. Um, I don't know, but from my experience, a lot of the times, if you have these, you know, long things, people tend to, you know, you know, push them or whatnot, and they come falling down and it's annoying. And as you can see, it tested pretty well. I actually was quite violent with it. Oh, uh, well, up until the point where, you know, it actually fell out because it wasn't glued in place yet. But the prototype went well. So I just glued it in place using some hot glue and securing it from both angles and then putting it down on some wax paper or a baking paper just so I get a nice flat bottom. Such as that. And that actually works pretty darn good. 
Now the XPS phone, the big benefit with it is that it's quite light, so here that washer actually makes a huge difference. Now with all of my elements built, it was time to do the Mod Podge and uh, black paint. Now I don't have that much black paint, so for me it's mostly a little bit grey, and I'm just doing this just to know where I have covered a piece with paint. And to each their own, I'm not that bothered with it, because I know I will be coming in and priming these black with my airbrush. Now the first color I am coming in with, and I'm using my airbrush here just to make a zenithal, is Castle Grey from Army Painter. And here I really wanted these to, you know, have a directional light because, well, I think it just looks better. And for me, that was the Castle Grey where I start to define, you know, where does the light come from and where does, you know, the midtones and the shadows come. But painting these up, I actually went deeper than I've ever gone to the rabbit hole of painting stone, and you will see what I mean momentarily. I have mentioned this before, that stone is very rarely grey, and I figured, you know what, I want to try to take this to the next level. So the first paint I'm coming in with is Cultist Robe, a sort of moss, dark moss green, I would say, color from Army Painter, and I'm stippling this on the lower part of nearly all of the stones. I'm sort of imagining that some sort of mold or something might have been built up. So I'm trying to just, you know, stipple that on as organically as possible. And for these half pieces, I of course defined, you know, how they have toppled over so these won't be standing according to my light scheme. And here you can see I'm actually coming in with some desert yellow and I'm stippling that on all pieces. And then I'm actually coming in with some werewolf fur and this I am also stippling in here and there. And then I think it's only two paints left which I used and the paints were uh, wolf grey which is sort of a grey, well grey blue I guess color. So I'm just stippling it in here and there, creating what I would say almost a cacophony of different colors. And if you look at stone, you can see that stone actually has a myriad of different colors. It is not just gray. Now the final color I'm coming in with, and this actually made me a little bit worried because it's quite stark, but that's dragon red. And it almost looked like blood, which I felt like, well, you know what, I wanted to really go for some some sort of wine red. So I would have wanted a more, a, a less saturated version of this, but I, I chose to trust the process and just have faith. And you can actually see if you, you know, squint your eyes that it actually does start to look like stone. Now, once I had all of these wonderful uh, undercoating and, and different colors on, I'm going to come in with some dungeon uh, base color that I got from the Army Painter set, and I'm doing a liberal dry brush. All of these dry brushes, I'm trying to think where light is coming from, so I'm going in the direction of the light. Now, for the second part of this is to, of course, do the dungeon highlight, and here I'm using a different brush for this, a little bit more directed, but I'm trying to almost always catch the edges, because that is what sort of makes the shape very readable. Now, finally, the dungeon effects, which is, I'm guessing, just a white color. I'm coming in with that on the absolute, uh, you know, peaks of the highlights, and I'm not being very shy here. I'm, I'm trying to take it up to 11, actually. Now you would know this process. You see I've cut down a, a bunch of kitchen rolls and whatnot. These are excellent for, uh, you know, any crafts to stand on while you spray on your wash. Now this is a homemade wash. It's very simple. It consists of water, inks and fluid. So once that had dried, I come back in with that absolute highlight, and this time I'm being much more careful just touching up the upper parts of all of the stones and making sure that I retain that light direction. And at this point, I think it's time to have a look at the final result.
Alright folks, so if you're still with me, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for watching, and if you liked the video, then do smash that like button and please consider subscribing. All of these things help the channel. And of course, the best way to help me more directly is to pledge a few dollars and join my Patreon. Joining will give you access to my private Discord server where I and a bunch of people are creating a great community of creative and supportive people. And on that note, I want to thank my dear patrons for their support over the past weeks. And so thank you so much, Andrew Cummings. Brandon, Michael Milligan, Nicholas O'Sullivan, Rice P, Shane Murphy, Stefan Winter, Sunny Headcase, Blake Crowell, Bu Algrian, Chris Grock, Volker Görler, and a special shout out as always goes to my champion and legend level patrons. Chris Sagers, for the XP, Mad Nurse, Leander, and Niklas Sredenlind. Thank you so much, good folks. You are amazing. So I hope you all have a nice day, stay safe, and I will see you in the next video.